Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in Las Vegas. We are at Adip's reInvent 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here, you know, four days, basically three full days, had a half a day on day zero. This is really day one, the kickoff of all the keynotes. Devine Rouse here, the VP of AI at Databricks, former entrepreneur, Mosaic, before that, another company sold to Intel, Devine's CUBE alumni going back, I think, 2015, but great to see you. You're in the hot seat uh, in the industry. Uh, Databricks continues to, um, impress and thunder along, yeah. Uh, you know, from, from the Spark days and now Data Lakes and now Generative AI is just really kind of lifted the, the the value of the data and then the architecture yeah. and the investments in Data Lakes. You're seeing open table formats, you're seeing developers coding with data and obviously model, model diffusion. I mean, all the innovations coming in off the core data, you're in, you're in the center of the action. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for the last 20 years, we've been building data technologies, and the promise had always been like, if you log it, you'll figure out something really amazing to do with it. And uh, I think now we've, we're kind of getting there. It took a while, uh, <laughs> but now I think we're at a point where we do have some ideas of how to, how to do something interesting, like improving your business operationally yeah. or even new experiences. You know, yeah, we used to have an expression, this is back in the old big data Hadoop days before that crashed, but that really spawned <laughs> the, that, that kind of when that kind of went away, it also became the fertilizer for that next wave, which, That's right. which was, you know, all that entrepreneurial big data thinking was the people who were data hoarders, I call them, like they just store data just in case. I mean, there if you have been storing data and just parking it away, it's coming back in big value. And yeah. now that opened up, I think you go back maybe seven years ago when you started to see people go, okay, I got to get some sort of rain around my data. It's not the data warehouse. I got to think differently. That's right. And then you fast forward today is has been... Um, uh, the pioneers. What have you been seeing as you come in and drive the AI agenda to Databricks, which did all that lake house, all the great work. I call it the foundational work, but now you're starting to see new formations, more expansion. What's been the key to success for this this part of history? Well, I think, the fa like you said, the foundational work. So the foundational work actually goes back to data warehousing, where we, we organize the data, govern it, log it, monitor it then started to add capabilities with compute on top of it. We, we invented at Databricks called the, the, the lake house. And really now we've extended that further. I would argue that we're still in a foundational building. We're building a new foundation with NAI, uh, and I'll talk about in a second, but we call this the data intelligence platform. How can I use my data to customize intelligence? And can I build uh, new capabilities that others can't because I have some unique data, like those data hoarders, right? Yeah. They got this wonderful institutional knowledge in their data. Yeah. How do I extract that and then make a better product or a better customer experience or better operations? That's really the name of the game right now. We're laying that foundation. Yeah, and you're seeing, um, I would agree, by the way, we've been covering this and not, I mean, first of all, we love the whole data layer evolution, but all the core engineering is going down at the physical layer. You look at the chips, Trinium 2 now is generally yeah. available. You got ultra uh, clusters, you got NVIDIA with the monster, I call it the God box on-prem. <laughs> it's the scale of infrastructure that's showing some unique um, value. That it is. It's hard to just, you can't just generate trajectory, this diseconomies of scale. So if you had a, you're at a scale like an AWS or an NVIDIA or say Databricks, you're seeing things that are, I would say, a first generation scaled system. Yeah. What are you guys seeing at Databricks? Because you guys have that unique position one, Databricks is the company with the platform, but also your customer base. You mentioned J.B. Morgan Chase. They're going to be coming on the queue. They're just on stage. You've got enterprise with significant value in data. We and did. they're not going to just go to OpenAI and say, hey, use it. They're going to want to build their own yeah. on-prem or on the cloud or in cloud operations. This is where everyone's going. Yeah, I mean, what we found is uh, something like 85, 90% of, uh, of these Gen AI projects never went anywhere. And, and it's not because things didn't work to some degree, but it's that this, the, the plumbing just wasn't there. Like, how do I do things securely? How do I verify that my, the data that is super important and critical to my business doesn't go places it shouldn't? Um, how do I you know, get access controls and monitoring worked out? So we call this the governance layer. And, and Databricks really had invented this for data. We have basically co-opted that and extended it for Gen AI. Then, so that's, that's the kind of table stakes before yeah. you can get anything into production. The next thing then starts becoming quality. So I think we had the wrong mental model in 2023 where everyone thought uh, Gen AI or LLMs were kind of magic in a box. And yeah. it turns out it's not. It turns out you actually have to engineer things to make them work reliably. Yeah. And so I think 2025 is going to be exciting because now we can have these tools where customers can actually start to experience, uh, engineer those experiences um, and, and get the performance required to support an application. 
Yeah. And you know, remember the days when I, I think when you first came on the queue, we we're still kind of in the infrastructure as code kind of honeymoon yeah. of uh, DevOps and DevSecOps, you know, APIs that connect systems. But now with generative AI, they're connecting data. Yes. And so now you have to think of it differently. You can't just have a black box API. What's behind that from a security standpoint? Yeah. And then there's all these like tunings with models, you know, weights and, and you know, fine tuning with different configurations. With the advent of, say, inference and this kind of agent layer, you're starting to see that you can abstract away all that complexity. Yeah. How do you guys view that? Because I think that's the next progression of, of data lakes where, okay, I got the foundation. Yep. Now I got to start stitching together some value propositions that are real gettable. And, and there are use cases out there that people are getting and from, you know, basic retrieval to some rudimentary stuff. But that they're not moving the needle yet, but they're starting to see it because now the data complexity of managing it goes away. That's exactly right. So uh, again, it comes down to that promise, the initial promise, I, I log it all and it will come. Well, I'll figure <laughs> out a way to make it work. That's still hard, right? I think up until very recently, you still had to have someone who's a data engineer. That person had to be able to write SQL queries and organize data, do ETL. Like it was, it was fairly technical. Now what's happening is we can start to automate those components. And when we automate those components, now we can start to focus on the insights I derive. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're slowly but surely moving toward that world, and Gen AI is a big step function in that in that trajectory. You guys have been a big proponent of, I call open source for, for data, and obviously yeah. every event, uh, Databricks, Ollie's been hardcore on this. Obviously yeah. the Berkeley pedigree uh, has has a nice nice edge there with it. Um, they've done a lot of things that have moved the needle uh, in, in the industry. But when you start thinking about the developer relationship to the infrastructure, yeah. it's always been, you know, infrastructure as code, we did before, we were talking about that, but like, I have a developer, okay, I got a database. Yeah. The old school, I, I code, I store stuff in the database. Now it's not database, it's a large system. Yes. It's a lake, it's it's multiple things now. As a developer, as you start to see the open source models kind of fuel the appetite of these new open source developers, yeah. you're starting to see some patterns. What are you seeing with developers right now and their relationship? Is Lambda, is, is Lambda the model where, hey, I just want a functional call, I don't need servers. Is inference the Lambda-like feature, what's the developer um, vibe right now? How do you guys see that? Because that's the code that needs to be cracked. Yeah. Because once the developers have this simplicity right. of just coding, whether well, it's code assistant or engineering down to the kernel. Yeah, so I think what, what companies want and what developers want is control over the things they need to control. Sometimes maybe that extends a little bit too far and they do things they shouldn't, but, but overall I think it's about providing the right knobs and, and control that you can you can very clearly specify. And that's code, really. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think serverless is a huge uh, step forward. I actually, I think serverless is the cloud as cloud was to on-prem. It frees you up from all this management layer of things. And so Lambda, I think, was a good first step there. I'm not sure if just the function was the right way to do it, but yeah. we, we have our own version of serverless where now I'll be able to like spin up N GPUs not have to deal with any of the resiliency or networking, all that stuff, and just access it from a, from a, a notebook. That's hugely powerful. This is a, a really cool tool I'm excited about within Databricks. So I think we have these capabilities of like basically freeing the developer from those, 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 yeah. those banalities <laughs> of dealing with the infrastructure yeah. to allow them to focus on the business logic of what yeah. they care about. Yeah, I interviewed Ali, um, I can't remember which month it was, I think it was before the event, he was so excited to say we're all serverless now. Yeah. Databricks is now 100% serverless. On all the new products, on yeah. All the new products, yeah. Uh, so that's a huge milestone. Um, talk about your relationship with AWS. You guys have always had a great relationship. Uh, I know Ali talks about it too, but now with Matt on stage talking about some of these new table buckets, S3 table buckets, they got iceberg table support um, in in the the tabular stuff they're doing and other things, S3 metadata. So a lot of storage. You've seen a lot of storage activity. Yep. And then also he's introducing and Swami will talk about the agents. Talk about your relationship with AWS and, and here at reInvent, what you see as the, for your customers and what you guys are doing at Databricks. Yeah, I mean, we have a long history with, uh, with AWS. It was actually the first cloud that was supported by Databricks. And uh, it actually is the biggest still, uh, over a billion in revenue uh, that we generate on, on top of AWS. So clearly very important to us. We actually just recently signed you know, a five-year deal uh, solidifying that partnership. We both, us and AWS, fully anticipate that we will burn through that deal in less than five years and renew it early uh, <laughs> because things are just, they're actually accelerating, interestingly enough. Uh, as part of that deal, though, Gen AI, which is you know obviously the thing that I'm, I, I think about every day, um, is a big part of it. How we deal with AI compute, as you mentioned, I mean, this starts becoming front and center because 
it's the cortex. It's the thing that actually can extract this value. Um, we want to have a, a diversity of different solutions like Trainium and Infrentia. That's uh, and, uh, AWS is investing heavily on it. So we're working with them as partners on this. Um, of course, we're supposed to be working with NVIDIA and, uh, and you know, that's a gold standard of, of, of compute here. But, but yeah, I think this is very exciting for us going forward. And, uh, you know, I, there, there are lots of different places where we inter intersect, like Bedrock, we integrate into and we get an anthropic models through this. So there's a lot of touch points with yeah, AWS. I was talking to Matt Garman and Dave Brown. I just posted my conversation with Dave, Dave Brown as well. The idea of getting close to the hardware reminds us about the 90s when you had to yep. kind of do memory management, like all these like hardcore assembler, you know, machine coding. And then, you know, so I grew up in that world. Yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> so our, we're back. I mean, we're, yeah. the value extraction down at that level is significant when you start to integrate with the abstraction layers above it. Yeah. What you can tune there. Talk about the, how important that is for the, for the developer, because with yeah. code assistance, the alpha developers are going straight down to the hardware. Yeah, I think uh, what what no one seems to understand, at least at the beginning of the AI revolution, was that AI is a fundamentally different kind of workload. It's not like SaaS, where the business logic lives mostly in the software. The value actually comes from the, the computations that are happening on the hardware. And when you're running a neural network on a piece of hardware, it takes all of it. Yeah. It's using all the hardware. So you don't you can't time slice in the same way. So the, the fundamental economics are a bit different. And, you know, NVIDIA is a big winner here yeah. for that reason. Yeah. It'd be great to have you. I know you're super busy. I know you got 30 seconds left here on the, on the segment uh, and before you go. Your vision uh, for AI as you look back, you've been an entrepreneur, now you're at Databricks. You're, you guys are doing great. Uh, business performance, the technology's doing great. What's your vision for AI? Folks watching out there, putting their customer excellence centers together, yeah. starting to figure out what benchmarks matter. There's no standards yet. They're just trying to get their arms around it. What's your vision? How would you talk to them out there? about what you, how you view AI right now. Yeah, in the next one to three years, we're gonna be able to build solutions end-to-end -end that are not just one LLM or one model. They're actually a composition of many things. And it's basically separating out the deterministic components like database lookups, function yeah. calls, to these non-deterministic things which are like squishy human language. And I think now we have this paradigm where we can combine the two and build really new applications. So there's gonna be tremendous unlock of value here from data, and new applications we can build. So I think the next three years are gonna be very exciting. 2025 is really the beginning of it for me. It's when, yeah. I kind of joke, it's when the shit gets real. <laughs> it's fun, I gotta tell you, I've never been more excited. Up and down the stack is action. Get the code development up top with code assistance, but then still, the human in the loop is gonna get Absolutely. down and dirty and more more old school, like. In some ways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Enable us to be faster in those old school ways. Full circle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. assembler, registers, core dump, debugging. <laughs> Not bringing the agents for those. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> They're being great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate Thanks for having it. me. Naveen Rao, VP of AI at Databricks. Um, been in the industry for a very long time and AI early and now as it starts to go next level and gets real, uh, he's that leading the helm over there at Databricks. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.